It's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you, for those of you who don't already know Peter, uh, Peter Schubert. Uh, Peter is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and a principal investigator within the CBR. He's also uh, working for Canadian Blood Services as a development scientist. And in that role, he is actually uh, the, the chief scientist lead for the NETCAD laboratory. And I've asked Peter to talk to us a bit about NETCAD today so that you can appreciate that uh, this is a potential source of, of uh, research materials for your projects. And, um, and just to tell you how the NETCAD laboratory fits in with the, the modernization of the blood system for Canada. So Peter, over to you. Thanks so much, Dina, for the introduction and actually the invitation to speak here. Let's see if that works. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can in presentation mode, it's good. Excellent, okay. Well, hello everyone. So thanks for joining the, the CBR seminar today. So what I want to do in this seminar is um, three topics. One, as Dana was alluding, I'm uh, responsible for the NETCAD blood for research facility, which belongs to the uh, Canadian Blood Services. And I just want to give a brief introduction to the facility. If you have not seen this so far, um, a little bit about the structure and function of this facility. And then I thought I will give you just a little bit of flavor of what projects we are running out of this facility. One more on an innovation aspect, um, a small, not small, an, an initiative we started on non-destructive quality control testing. And the other one is a truly development project to reintroduce local reduced cold to whole blood uh, into our um, blood component um, inventory. So just from a disclosure perspective relevant to this talk, uh, I have received some grant funding from Terumo BCT for that local reduced uh, whole blood project. And I'm co-inventor on a registered patent for the non-destructive quality control testing. So just from an organizational uh, standpoint, you see at the bottom, the NETCAD team, and I will get into detail who these people are and what their functions are. So we belong to the group of Ken McTaggart, who is the Associate Director for Product and Process Development within Canadian Blood Services. And that whole team um, is directed by Chantal Bambrun, who is the director for uh, formerly called Center for Innovation and now uh, rebranded to Innovation and Portfolio Management. And that whole department belongs into the division of um, Dr. Isra Levy, who is the Vice President, Medical Affairs and Innovation. And he directly reports to Graham Shear, who is the CEO of Canadian Blood Services. So just that you um, have a little bit of understanding how we are structured and organized. So from uh, the perspective of the net team, so this is a picture taken during our COVID pandemic, so all staff were on site throughout the entire pandemic. And the team is um, you know, broken down in several sub-teams. So from a management perspective, as Dana was saying, I'm responsible for the team. I have an operational manager, Lee, and we have project leads, which are responsible for helping me to get projects uh, up and running within our group, within product and process development and the link uh, to the NETCAD facility. And the facility itself from an operational perspective has three subgroups. One is the donor clinic, which is very important as a front end that we really have donors coming into our facility to donate blood for uh, processing to make components for our studies. So Bonbon, bon, Christine, and Vinny are part of that team. We have a production team comprising of Emmanuel, Joe, and Ricky, who process the whole blood into the component as we need them, mainly plasma, red cell, and platelets. 
And then last but not least, we have a testing team. In the moment, um, Ruvena and Shamim, who do the quality assessment of products uh, after production and after or within the projects and studies we are carrying out. Um, I have a project lead, Anita, here, who is uh, actually located in Edmonton, so she's not physically at NETCAT, but it's not a problem because she's leading uh, projects, you know, from the distance, and it's not a problem at all. And we are heavily connected to Dana's lab, uh, mainly Prana, to help us with a lot of um, testing capacity uh, using equipment, which is located in Dana's lab mainly flow cytometer and thromboelastography at that point in time. So just to give you a little bit in, um, in context of the, net, the NETCAT network, what we do and how we fit in into the bigger scheme of Canadian blood services. So there are several elements we are linked to. One, uh, as I had alluded already with the um, whole blood project, we are very engaged in innovation. So we are interested in testing and playing with, uh, in, the, in the end, the next gen blood products. And I will mention a few throughout the talk. And we are heavily linked to Canadian Blood Services supply chain. So everything what we develop in our facility or in the product and process development group goes to supply chain for verification and for uh, pushing out into the um, Canadian blood bank systems that we can, you know, provide these products uh, controlled by quality control and quality assurance uh, to hospitals and in the end to patients we serve. And research is also a big part of our daily uh, endeavor. So uh, Dana, Ed Prystel and Mark Scott are uh, scientists out here belonging to the larger system of uh, scientists within uh, Canadian Blood Services. Um, research is collaborative within our organization, but we also have collaborations with blood industry, Canadian Armed Forces, and other blood operators around the world, just to make sure that we are really at the cutting edge of our research endeavors within the organization. And as Dana was alluding to, and that's a very important element for our blood for research facility, that is the provision of blood and products to not only external, uh, internal, but also external research groups. And many um, researchers within the CBR are actually part of that deal. So they can obtain blood and blood products through the facility. Um, we provide any kind of products which we have uh, operationally, like plasma, red cell, platelets, but also specimen. And um, I posted the website here, so you can go to blood.ca and look at research uh, products and services. Uh, there's a uh, tutorial how to obtain blood. So we have a um, smaller REB system to obtain blood and plot products where it doesn't have to go through the uh, big regulatory system. So we just want to make sure that projects are ethically sound and that the demand of products is reasonable for our facility. But we are more than happy to support any studies um, from researchers, um, not only here at UBC, but we also serve across the country. So if you have any questions or you are interested in obtaining blood and blood products, please go to the website or reach out to um, me and we can certainly help you to get the paperwork in order to obtain blood and blood products. And lastly, um, one very important element of our facility is also to help hospitals. So we get a lot of uh, inquiries from hospitals when something is going a little bit sideways at a unit or sitting in a certain environment, which it shouldn't be as per SOP. And they always ask, can we do some small studies to investigate if that deviation from the SOP has any impact on the product quality? So we are the right platform and facility to really um, enable these kind of questions. And we are very happy to participate this way because it's very unique within the Canadian Blood Services uh, system to have such a facility to target these kind of questions. 
So just one more um, note on next generation blood components before we go into these two projects I was mentioning before. So what we have in the moment, as I was saying, we have um, plasma, we have red cells, we have platelets, and these are the current components we have in stock with a few modifications, but from the main three tracks. What we do in our development work and also innovation work is to look at to look at um, what can we do next and what is on the doorstep. So we are trying to, for example, um, replace some of the plasma in the platelet concentrates with a platelet additive solution to improve the quality of platelets and at the same time to save more uh, plasma refractionation. We are considering uh, new red cell additive solutions to improve quality of red cells. We are trying to freeze dry plasma rather than freezing them as a liquid. And as I was saying, um, we um, started now looking at bringing whole blood as a blood component back into the, our inventory. The next layer of a modification, what the organization is looking at is introducing a system called pathogen activation. I don't wanna go into detail. It is a system based on UV treatment of in the moment plasma concent uh, platelet concentrates to make our already very safe product even safer. But there are certain developmental studies required to really look at the feasibility and we have finished um, the development work on um, introducing that technology for platelets into CBS and the pilot already completed in our, on our site. Uh, there are many other aspects from the pathogen activation technology front, but some of them are not quite ready. And we are just always waiting till the industry can provide us with some um, devices to test this out at our facility. Um, and as an other dimension of the innovation work is the way how we store products, for example. So um, as you know, platelets have to be stored at room temperature, shaken uh, good for seven days, which is not as great, but it's not, uh, you know, there's always room for improvement. So if you, for example, would put a platelet into the cold, we could store it for 14 days. The application might be a little bit more tailored for, patient, for certain patients, but at least it would give us um, a little bit of room to improve the storage uh, conditions for these kind of products. There's, as I was saying before, lyophilization of plasma. Other products like platelets can be lyophilized as well, but these processes are still at the beginning of trying to understand the impact of these processes on the component quality. But that is what the facility is really all about to really investigate and um, look into these options and analyze what these, the impact would be on the quality and safety on our product. So MedCat in the end is a playground for these kind of activities. And last but not least, kind of a fourth dimension, it said non-destructive quality control testing. And I will get to that in a minute, how that would impact our inventory. So just to see or show you and demonstrate that there are a lot of different directions we can take to really look at um, novel aspects of blood component uh, production and storage for the best interest of you know, our inventory and our patients we serve through all the products. So as I was saying, uh, one of the two projects which I want to briefly discuss with you uh, today is the non-destructive quality assessment of platelet and red cell uh, quality using, um, you know, mini bags. So, um, as you know, our reality, meaning CBS's reality, is that um, the products we provide need to be safe and effective throughout the shelf life. Uh, as I was mentioning before, platelets have a shelf life of seven days. At that point, uh, red cells are stored in the cold for 42 days and plasma is stored frozen for a year. So our manufacturing uh, process quality control program uh, requires that we routinely hold 1% of our inventory of the individual products uh, to expiry and then check the product quality. That means that the units which we hold, these 1%, 
are in the end wasted and end up in the um, biosafety bin because it's expired and can't be transfused. So the only thing what we get out of these units are the data of quality throughout the shelf life. So in the Canadian Blood Services current system, we are producing about 2,000 uh, platelet concentrates per year. The numbers might be changed a bit, these are a little bit older numbers, and roughly 8,000 uh, red cells per year, which ends up in um, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, which we are wasting through that. A uh, very important quality control system. So we were thinking, is there any way that we can somehow two birds with a stone that we can get the quality control data, but at the same time have a way to utilize these units because they're perfectly okay for transfusion. So the idea was if there's a way we can take a small sample from the unit earmarked for quality control and store that sample separately from the unit it was derived from and hold just the sample to expiry. And the requirement for such a system would be that the quality attributes in that sample is uh, representative of the unit it was derived from. For the end, that is what we were hoping to achieve from such a system as shown in the cartoon. So if we could do this and um, the unit could be returned to the inventory and the quality control small bag would be called test container. Um, the sample in the test container becomes non-destructive if we can just um, derive it by um, sterile docking of that test container to the mother unit. So that would of course provide a huge opportunity that quality control would not impact our inventory because the unit where the sample was taken can go back into inventory and can be used for transfusion. The cost for quality control would go down tremendously, as I was showing, can be 100,000 to millions of dollars. Um, you know, we can build a very robust system. We can even use more than 1% for quality control testing. And it gives us maybe an opportunity to look uh, to understand better tumor donor factors, especially when you look at red cells because they derive from one donation or from one donor donation. So um, they were saying we were trying to establish the system for platelet concentrates and red cells. So we started with platelets that seem to be more important because um, we have a shorter shelf life and we wanted to see they're a little bit more finicky to store if we can get a system up and running. So we started from a regular platelet concentrate and then needed to somehow scale down the system to a small aliquot. We made um, smaller fractions of the bag, sealing these kind of compartments in the unit and filled those and uh, looked if these um, the quality of these smaller aliquots in that um, would represent the quality of the mother bag, and it did. We scaled down even further to very small amount of platelet concentrate in these uh, in-house made small test containers. So they're just called R and P, depending on the shape. R was called uh, rectangular P, like pencil shape, uh, just to distinguish these size uh, it is shapes and the numbers are the fill volumes, the nominal fill volumes. I just don't want to torture you with a lot of data, but we had to collect a lot of data to really show, as I was saying before, whether the uh, quality in these small aliquots is representative of the quality in the unit it was, uh, it was uh, taken from. So just showing here, the pH, which is a very important quality control parameter at CBS. Um, plotted here is the delta in pH, meaning the pH volume in the small test container versus the pH in the regular unit the um, sample was derived from and just plotted as a delta. So you can see that um, there's of course variations between how full I fill such a small container. So we wanted, of course, optimize the fill volume to a given size and shape. And these kind of differences show very quickly that there is um, a kind of a, an optimal size, shape, and uh, fill volume ratio. 
And the other piece, what we learned with the uh, uh, platelet concentrates um, is that if you see the blue bars, that is what's just filled with the platelet concentrate as in volume, if you look and further the red, green and purple bars, we learned that you need an air bubble in these systems to really make the quality difference minimal. And that is due to the fact that you have a very small volume in these test containers. And when you put that on an agitator, they don't really, the, the liquid is not flowing as what we have in a plated concentrate. The solution has to stay in motion and the air bubble for a really interesting observation is med mediating this flow by when the air bubble just moves back and forth through the motion of the agitator. So it is very important to have this air bubble in, um, in these small test containers in order to have a very representative quality um, assessment. And as I was saying, very important for us is the fact that there is a really strong correlation between the qualities in the mother unit versus the test container, which is shown here. So we have a really tight, um, or a very high correlation between a variety of uh, parameters, which I'm not showing. So we looked at many aspects of metabolism, plated activation, and even plated functional data. So we are convinced that we identified a, a system which works, that we can take a small sample from a unit and can get the quality data out of the sample and maintaining the remaining uh, piece of the unit for so as we're saying, it is important or what we learned, shape, size, fill volume, and air bubble, that combination is very important to really get an optimized system. Uh, similar to the platelets we played with red cells, we made similar um, shape and sizes of red cell test containers. We looked at optimizing the fill volume of these different test containers with red cells. Red cells are a little bit easier to handle because they're A um, in, at four degrees and they don't need to be shaken, so they're less finicky than platelets. Um, again, we needed to make sure that we get the right, the right shape, size, fill volume combination, but here is no air bubble required because it doesn't have to be shaken. So similar to the platelet um, study, we looked at um, red cell quality parameters to make sure that we get the right shape, size, and fill volume of red cells in these containers to make sure that they, the quality of these derived samples mimic what we see in the respective mother unit the sample was derived from. And you can see here, we looked, for example, at uh, red cell count, we looked at um, hemoglobin, uh, content or we look at um, red cell hemolysis and you can see the the, um, the delta so the difference in the quality attributes is dependent on fill volume given a, a certain shape and size so we are able to come up with the best sh uh, shape size fill volume combination to get the, the closest match to the mother unit quality so in the end um, where we are at that point, we established a proof of concept for this non-destructive quality control testing system for both platelet concentrate and red cell concentrates by systematic optimizing, as I said, shape, size, and fill volume of mini bag design. Um, we have built, or Ken McTaggart, who is engineer by design, um, built certain platforms that we can fill these uh, red cell or platelet uh, test containers appropriately by building uh, in-house made jigs to really ensure that the volume, what we identified as optimal and the air bubble, which we identif uh, identified um, in these studies are maintained throughout filling um, endless red cell, um, platelet and red cell TCs. So we called the red cell because it's red, it's our Ferrari system, and the platelet is our Lamborghini system. So, as I was saying, the data which we collected both on the platelet and red cell side demonstrate similar in vitro qualities in these mini bags as compared to the mother bag these uh, samples were 
uh, derived from um, Canadian Blood Services trying to get a business case together and hope that we can convince um, Health Canada that this system is um, very beneficial to maintain um, our great quality control system, but at the same time can free these units which were earmarked and then discarded after quality control testing for uh, putting them back into the inventory for transfusion. And of course, you know, as I was saying before, showing in these bar diagrams, we will have a lot of product modifications which we are trying to introduce into our inventory and all modifications or product modifications have to be tested in the system if we want to apply this to a new products which we introduce. So there's always um, that extra layer of work to really um, ensure that that non-destructive system is working once we modify a current product. So switching gears, so that is um, one of the innovation products. So this project or this non-destructive project is truly innovative. There's no system out there so far. So we are quite happy that we were able to um, establish such a system, which hopefully not only in Canadian blood service, but in other blood operators finds uh, a useful application. Um, now, as I said, switching gears to uh, truly development project, which is the reintroduction of whole blood as a blood product, as a transfusable product, so not comp component processing, and rather taking the uh, whole blood which comes from a donor and re-transfuses into a patient. So um, this is, as I said, it's more a development project because other blood operators either use this system already or um, working on that. So we, that is not that we invented that, we're just trying to establish that for our um, own organization. So who is interested in this kind of product um, there's the Department of Defense, and uh, Dina is um, connected to Dr. Andrew Beckett, who is um, um, working for the Royal Canadian uh, Medical Services at the Canadian Armed Forces, who is very interested in such a product for military use. An emergency department would like to get hands on this product. Um, we're working with Andrew Shi at BGH to um, find out uh, the feasibility of bringing such a product to the hospitals. And last but not least, lifelight helicopters and ambulances, uh, which in the moment just carry uh, components in their vehicles or um, uh, helicopters. And they would really like to have whole blood in their um, um, ambulances or helicopters to uh, bring this product to the front line and actually bring the transfusion closer to the bleeding person, uh, patient rather than transporting them to the hospital for proper treatment. And one of the drivers for the lifelight helicopters is Dr. Homer Tien, who is the CEO of um, Orange, the lifelight helicopter uh, organization in Ontario. So um, why we are doing this? Um, we had, there was whole blood as a product, you know, decades ago um, used, and then it was switched to component therapy to have a more patient tailored approach for transfusions. But now looking at um, how whole blood can maintain hemostatic um, uh, treatment very well, whole blood became then back as an um, and really point of interest. It's not that we want to replace component therapy with whole blood treatment. It is just an add-on at that point. Um, the benefits of a whole blood treatment versus a component therapy for certain patients, um, and I get to that in a minute, would be fewer donor exposures because you have the whole blood from one donor and in a component therapy, you have few donors. You might not get the red cell and the plasma from one donor. So you have between two and six different donors in a component therapy versus one donor in a whole blood transfusion. 
um, there's a smaller volume to those because we would not need to add red cell additive solution and other solutions which we uh, add during the component processing that would not be uh, needed for the whole blood processing. Um, in the moment, there is an, a drive that whole blood as a product after, uh, at least in our world, glucose reduction could be stored for 14 to 21 days. And that would supersede what we have on the platelet. And for example, as I was saying, the shelf life currently is seven days. And last but not least, it would simplify resuscitation efforts, especially in austere environments. So um, not in so a little bit suburban areas in, in Canada or as seen, for example, in Australia. So um, what, what, what the product can do for us, um, as I was saying before, there are interests to extend the shelf life for platelets. Uh, by moving them from room temperature storage shaking into the cold. So these are cold platelets, but they can't be used for all kinds of platelet uh, treatments, but they are mainly used for um, actively ble bleeding, meaning trauma patients. And that would be the same for the whole blood product. It can only be used for trauma patients. But that is very important. That's why military emergency departments and life flight helicopters are so interested in that because the, these organizations or uh, folks see really bleeding patients and want to treat them as fast as possible. Um, it is known in the literature, and that comes mainly out of the US, that if you transfuse a bleeding patient within one hour with whole blood, you can reduce the mortality of the patient by about 50% because you don't have to transfer or because many patients um, pass away on the way to the hospitals. And if you can provide that um, at the front line of accidents, that would help uh, with reducing the mortality rates. So as I was saying, that's why many of these organizations who have bleeding patients as um, a client is very important. And from a processing perspective, um, we in Canada, we look or reduce uh, all our cellular products like platelets and red cells. And since whole blood is a cellular, is a com combination of cellular products, we need to look or reduce our whole blood. So in order to um, um, produce this, it's a simple step. It's a an, an special filter, which is um, made by Teruma BCT called Imuflex, and it is taking out the uh, white cells or the leukocytes of the whole blood. And it is also platelet sparing. That means it tries to keep as many platelets in the bag as possible, but we get to that in a second. So what we have done, and I will show some data on how the development uh, work was uh, executed. We have completed a um, product and process development feasibility study. We have published the study recently in transfusion in a um, Thor special issue. And we have um, assessed the platelet, red cell, and plasma in vitro qualities. And the next, and I will allude to that later, we want to move this product out of the development world into our supply chain and see um, if this product can be used in further studies to really um, help us to understand the product in uh, applications in hospitals and other settings. So as I was saying, there is a system out there which is licensed by Health Canada already. So it's a system which is just a filter to take out the white cells of the whole blood. That system, what Terumo BCT established, um, goes even further, not only to uh, look or reduce the whole blood, it also gives the ability to make a, a platelet uh, a PRP and a red cell concentrate, but that is not what CBS is considering. So in the moment, we are just um, taking part of that system and just look or reduce the whole blood and store the whole blood as a look or reduced um, you know, uh, unit. So. Um, from a study design, we wanted to look at several aspects that is quite um, uh, a lot of work. We wanted to make sure that we covered all grounds and all questions what can be asked. So as I was saying, 
CVS is only interested in a filtered product, but there are several blood operators, mainly in the US, which um, rather have an unfiltered product by design. We wanted to make sure that we understand the impact of filtration in our hands. So we had an filtered versus unfiltered study arm. The next one is we currently collect our whole blood in uh, blood, blood in a blood system and a blood bag system by Macropharma, but there's also you know that kit system Immuflex comes with a blood collection bag in the same anticoagulant what we are using. So there are two ways the whole blood could be collected either in that Immuflex system or be collected as we do currently and just replace the collection system in that Immuflex uh, bag system with our current Macropharma whole blood bag. So we wanted to see if there is an, an, a difference in the product quality, just to give supply chain a little bit more flexibility, which way they want to go. The next one is, it's a big one actually. So the uh, information for use is saying that the whole blood has to be filtered without, within eight hours. That would be very difficult to introduce to Canadian Blood Service since we hold our whole blood overnight. So the donation and filtration with eight hours is logistically challenging. So we wanted to um, investigate what is the impact of an, what we call early filtration. So within eight hours or late filtration, meaning 18 to 24 hours, meaning the filtration happens the next day after filtration, uh, after donation, just to make sure that we would give uh, Canadian Blood Services the opportunity if there is no difference um, to adjust um, the process accordingly. Um, and we wanted to see um, how the quality of that whole blood upon local reduction is throughout a three week period of time. So we tested the quality after every week on day seven, 14 and 21. So we had a very ambitious program with a test panel. We wanted to make sure that we really understand that product as much as we can looking at whole blood aspects. We looked at residual leukocytes, which is important for main, uh, making sure that the local reduction is working. We're looking at metabolic activities. Um, potassium level is very important for transfusion and hemostatic function of the whole blood itself. And then we looked at um, red cell plated and plasma aspects in the whole blood because these components are still in there, looking at typical um, component quality uh, in vitro um, attributes. So I just run through a few of these um, quality parameters that you get the idea of um, what the impact of these different aspects we were looking at will have. So I don't go into much detail just to get you a flavor uh, how the study was conducted and what we learned from the study. So on the left, you see how the filtration is set up. On the top, you have either the macropharma bag or the blood collection bag from the Immuflex system, and you have the leukoreduction filter. And then at the bottom, you have the um, primary bag of the leukoreduced whole blood, um, which is also the storage bag of the whole blood. So here, we, uh, just to show look, uh, leukoreduction. This is residual white cell counts in units, and you see that they are um, very low compared to what a whole blood unit is. And compared to the, um, the standard, what we have on uh, cellular component to see criteria, um, they are way below what we have to um, achieve in leukoreduction for our components. So this product would easily uh, meet the QC criteria for blood components. Just to say that now, and I will uh, elaborate on that later on, for whole blood, since it's a new product for Canada, there, is no, there are no QC criteria out there. So that's why we also wanted to go very broad in really understanding what the local reduction and the quality uh, of this product would give us in terms of suggesting quality control criteria for this new product. So next, what we looked at is yield. So we 
wanted to make sure that that although it's a platelet sparing filter that we have um, you know platelet left upon um, the look of uh, reduction filtration and um, just to you know um, highlight what we were plotting here so T stands for the terumo back and M for the macropharma back E versus L is the early versus late filtration. So this is the um, color designation for this data. So um, as I was saying, we had an unfiltered and the filtered, uh, the, the unfiltered and the filtered arm. Let's ignore it for the time being, I will always summarize what the filtration will impact, but let's maintain, uh, mainly look at the, um, the filtration study arm. So you see here in the whole blood, this is the uh, platelet yield, what we have in the whole blood unit. And you see that upon filtration, we have a certain loss and that was expected because it's a platelet sparing filter, but it does not mean that it does not take any platelets out. So there is a certain loss. And then there's um, a little a concrete loss, but that is typical for um, units that platelets are just, um, um, deteriorating to, to platelet storage lesion. So this is the loss of the filter. And what um, if we would apply what the platelet quality control criteria are for a unit, that we need to have platelet uh, count of or yield of 55 or greater. And you know, at the later storage time, we would have some problems to get this out the door. So we need to adjust the quality control parameter for this product um, if we were prompted to pro uh, propose some quality control criteria for this product. Um, the next one, so uh, just to summarize, so there is no difference regarding in which um, bag system the whole blood was collected. The filtration has an impact as I was showing. Um, there is no Um, there is um, no, no difference if uh, the unit was filtered early versus late and there is a decrease in platelet uh, uh, yield, but that is known from what we see in platelet uh, components already through um, what we call platelet storage lesion. Um, so looking at uh, the platelet count, so I wanted to make sure when we look at the data, what we get as a count and not as a yield, that we are aligned uh, with studies which are led in the literature. So this, this is a picture of a study carried out several years ago, and they plotted the, the platelet count, and that is just highlighted here, just to demonstrate that what they see in their study is similar to what we see in our study, though just broken down in day one, seven, 14, and 21, uh, looking here early versus late filtration, where there is no no difference in the platelet count. And these numbers here are similar to what they see in their uh, study collected at similar days what we had looked at. So these are the numbers which I pulled out of that graph. So the next one, what we looked at platelet activation, which we usually measure as the expression of P-selectin on the surface of platelets during activation and storage leads to platelet activation, that is a known fact. So we're looking at um, the CD62P, which is a P-selectin expression on the surface of platelets. And what is seen here, so we have a baseline platelet activation in whole blood or upon filtration. So there is no difference, but as soon as we shift the whole blood into the cold, platelets get heavily activated and we know that that's a typical uh, effect of um, storage lesion, uh, of, of cold storage because platelets don't like this and then uh, they maintain on that high activation level. So again here, whole blood, uh, the whole blood back system filtration early versus late has no impact on the quality and um, in storage yeah, we see a decrease and that is due to the uh, we looked at hemoglobin uh, per units, and the same, you have a little bit of drop here, 
in, uh, in red cells because we lose a few red cells in the filter, similar what we do with the platelet, but then they would maintain the same level throughout the three week storage. And this is the red cell QC criteria. They have to be larger than 40 and most of the unit would actually make that criteria. So again, here, uh, it is re regardless of the um, bag system, the whole blood is collected in or earth early versus late, there is no difference. Filtration of course has an impact, so it is reduced and during storage, there's a slight decrease, but that is again, due to what we call red cell storage lesion. Hemolysis is a very important aspect that is looking at how red cells lies during process or storage. So what we have here is there are a few units which we identified have extremely high hemolysis, but they are actually identified in um, a study which is done in Dana's lab looking at um, inherited uh, donors who have already high um, um, hemolysis levels of red cells. And coincidentally, we were able to identify that units which had these really extreme hemolysis uh, numbers that these were donors which were identified in the study Dana had carried out in her lab. So just from a red cell quality control criteria perspective, uh, for red cells, um, the hemolysis have to be below 0.8% and all the units which we had processed in the study um, had, would have uh, passed this criteria. So again, here, as we see from many others, um, the impact of um, whole blood uh, collection bag, the filtration and the filtration time has no impact on the quality. And there's a slight increase of hemolysis, which again is typical for um, the red cell um, um, storage lesion development. Uh, we looked at plasma proteins and that was done in Bell Sheffield's lab out in Hamilton, it's a CBS lab, um, looking at factor two, five and eight. So factor two is a, a fairly stable um, plasma protein. And then we looked at five and eight. Eight is a very important protein because it is part of our plasma quality control panel. So what we, oops, sorry, what we see here is that there is a drop um, throughout storage in factor eight activity. Um, but that is known in other uh, studies using whole blood um, and looked at the quality of or the activity of factor eight um, have seen the same decrease. So again, if you look at these uh, plasma factors, no Im impact on blood collection set filtration and early versus late filtration timing. And there's a decrease for the more labile factors as known in other uh, studies using whole blood. Um, lastly, we looked at um, um, the hemostatic function of whole blood. We use uh, the thromboelastometry system, the rhodium system, which we have in Dana's lab, looking at clot formation and um, did the kinetic of clot formation and destruction. So the alpha angle, which is shown here in the pictogram, what we obtain from the rhodium is really the starting kinetic, how fast a clot is formed. And that is plotted here. So you see that um, there is a decrease in the kinetic, so the clots are um, uh, formed a little bit slower with time, but the, the clot formation is very strong and it is seen in other studies that uh, whole blood is really hemostatically very active and very good for um, trauma patients. So again here, um, sorry. Um, so there is no impact of um, the, the bag system, the filtration and the filtration timing on the, um, the clot formation uh, kinetic and there's a slight decrease of the kinetic throughout the three week storage, but it's uh, not even statistically. So what we learned from this study is that there's no statistically significant impact on 
um, in which um, blood collection bag system we had collected the whole blood. So that is great from a um, um, supply chain perspective. The impact of filtration is very little. Um, yes, we're losing some platelets and a few red cells, but um, from a hemostatic perspective, um, it's not that dramatic. What was very important for us that what I was mentioning in the beginning that the IFU um, set out uh, eight hour filtration time could be extended because we don't see except for the uh, for a red uh, blood uh, a white blood cell count there's no significant difference in any parameters if the unit was filtered early versus late so we can clearly recommend from that study that the filtration can be extended out to 24 hours and um, many features what we see here are known in component storage and many of the data which we have collected are aligned with what is seen in um, studies from other blood operators. So uh, where we wanna go from here is we wanna um, bring that protocol to supply chain in order to verify what we um, carved out in the development space and hope that they can pro produce units for clinical studies um, uh, planned at Sick Kids in Toronto or at VGH in Vancouver, uh, provide units to the Canadian Armed Forces, um, and also use the, the experience and the supply chain verification for a submission to Health Canada. As I was saying so far, there is no quality control standard to this product, but we hope with the data we, pro, uh, we collected, we can provide and suggest uh, quality control criteria for that product. So, so we are just currently conducting a study looking at the impact of different anticoagulant. At the moment, we're using CPD, but there is some evidence that if you change that to CPDA1, that we can get even a longer shelf life than three weeks. So we are uh, currently testing that in a, in a smaller study, just looking at um, you know, the, the filtration timing as the main readout. We had built or Ken had built uh, a jig to really make sure that the setup of the whole blood filter and filtered product is set out as um, mentioned in the IFU. So that is very good for um, eventual supply chain introduction. So um, as I was saying, you know, this the study is a little bit simpler what we had done in the first place, and we are trying to see now if we can extend the shelf life to 35 days. So a big thank you to all the people who are involved in all the different endeavors what we have at NetCat. So uh, mainly to the donors which came throughout the pandemic to the facility to uh, for blood donations and make sure that we have blood and blood components, not for our internal projects, but also to provide blood and products to researchers like you. Um, the whole team, I'm very you know happy that they uh, came to the facility for to work every day throughout the pandemic so far. So big kudos for that. As I was saying, Ken um, is the, you know, um, the, the associate director for the whole team. Bill Scheffel and Washa did many of the, um, all the plasma protein assessment. Craig is very helpful um, with some insights on product and uh, product qualities. Dana and the whole team, uh, very important in collecting quality data for many studies. As I was saying, Anita and Tamiko is a project lead out in Ottawa. So thank you very much for um, attending, for your attention and open for any questions.